All right, welcome everybody. Thank you all for being here for the Arkansas Native Plant Society's October monthly webinar. We're very excited to have Justin Thomas here for this month's uh, program. Uh, this webinar is being recorded. Afterwards, the recording will be uploaded to our YouTube channel. If you'd like to learn more about the Arkansas Native Plant Society, you can do so by visiting our website at amps.org, and I'll put, drop that link into the chat here uh, as soon as we get started. Uh, joining AMPS is pretty simple. You just go onto the website, amps.org slash join, where you can use your PayPal account uh, to pay right now, um, you know, even before the webinar is over, if, if that's what you want to do. Uh, also be placing some links to our YouTube channel where you'll be able to um, uh, find the recording of this webinar afterwards. Uh, so look for that in the chat here shortly. And I'll also give you a link to our Facebook page, which is a great way to keep up with uh, upcoming uh, future upcoming opportunities to go on hikes uh, in Arkansas with various uh, educated botanists uh, to learn more about the native plants uh, and their habitats here in the great state of Arkansas, as well as uh, future webinars that will be coming down the pipeline. Uh, the next webinar in our series will be in December. Uh, we won't have one in November, but Saturday, December 10th at 10 a.m., Karen Willard will uh, give us a program on the carrot species of Arkansas. So that uh, carrot is a pretty complex genus of uh, sedges. And so uh, there's all kind of, uh, forget maybe dozens or hundreds of different species in that genus um, and a lot of them here in Arkansas. So being able to tell some of those apart uh, can be pretty challenging. So uh, she'll, she'll probably tell us some good tips and tricks and things to know, um, and hopefully you'll walk away with appreciation uh, for one of the largest genuses or genera of, of sedges. Uh, but tonight, we are very happy to have Justin Thomas, who is the uh, science director for the nonprofit Nature Site, uh, and also the director at the Institute for Botanical Training in Springfield, Missouri. So if you're looking to get some uh, botanical training, he offers all kinds of courses there. You go onto his website and I'll drop that in the link as, in the chat as well. Uh, you can uh, you know, see where he's gonna be teaching courses or uh, schedule him to come uh, teach for one of your groups if you have one. Um, so, it, but uh, tonight, um, Oh, just to tell a little bit about him real quick, he conducts ecological and taxonomic research and teaches plant identification workshops throughout the Central and Eastern North America. Uh, he's also an adjunct professor at the Missouri University of Science and Technology, where he teaches plant biology and vegetation of the Ozarks. Uh, Justin is also the co-author of the Ecological Checklist of Missouri Flora and holds a research associateship at Missouri Botanical Garden. Uh, Justin has spent most of the last 24 years performing botanical field work throughout the Midwest, which has equipped him with an encyclopedic knowledge of flora and related conservation issues. And we're really excited uh, to have him uh, as our speaker uh, tonight to talk to us about echesis, the nature of nature. So with that, I'll hand this over to Justin. Thank you for being here. Hey, thank you, Eric. Can everybody hear me? Am I good? Yep. You can hear we me. We can hear you. Cool. Uh, yeah, thanks for having me, uh, Eric, and thanks for letting me speak to the, uh, the Arkansas Native Plant Society. I'm on the board of Missouri Native Plant Society. I live in Springfield, Missouri, but I spend, you know, as much time as I can in Arkansas. Um, I can, you know, more or less born and raised in the Ozarks, and, and, I, and I, I always try to envision the lack of a political border, just, just think of the Ozarks as, as sort of a, a region that I'm from in and of itself. Um, because we get into even like conservation in, in Missouri, we kind of, there's that line there that doesn't really exist. Um, so I like, I like, uh, I like getting in Arkansas as much as I possibly can and, and have done a lot of work and constantly jealous of how much better the botany is in Arkansas than, than Missouri. So it's, it's a pleasure speaking to you all. Um, just to give you guys a little bit of, of my background, uh, Eric mentioned that I, that I do taxonomic and ecological work. Uh, that's true. I, I, I collect, um, I do taxonomic systematics work, mostly, not mostly, largely published work related to, to the genus Dicanthelium, like uh, panic, used to be panic grasses. Uh, now we kind of like to call them rosette grasses to separate them from, from panicum itself. Um, but yeah, sec second largest genus of, of, of plants in Eastern North America, second only, only to Carex, which it looks like you can hear about it's the next next webinar. Um, but yeah, so I, I do a lot of taxonomic work, uh, do a lot of ecological work uh, for, for both of the organizations I work for. We collect data and analyze that data, usually for, for uh, conservation entities, private and nonprofit and governments, um, but also 
um, in partnership with with uh, government and, and nonprofit entities. And you have some lots of field work, which really helps inform our, our plant IDs and our taxonomic concepts over time. Also teach plant ID workshops, mostly in May and June. Uh, these are oh, three, sometimes two, usually three or four day workshops, like the Vegetation of the Ozarks uh, class we do is, is I think that's five days. Um, and we don't even scratch the surface. <laughs> There's a lot of plants, but we, yeah, we do these field-based hands-on how to get the know, how to get a know, how to get to know the flora of, of different regions. And we do those throughout the Midwest and into Michigan, uh, east to western Pennsylvania and Ohio. Uh, done a few around Little Rock and Arkansas, and uh, yeah, so kind of cover the cover the Midwest. It's just good plant ID from a field-based perspective, and then. You know, all that driving and all that interaction with nature, um, I spend a lot of time sort of my, my free time, maybe my hobby is, is, is pondering that engagement, that, that, that connectivity, that, that seem like in the photograph here between the, the human world and the non, the, the, the more than human world. Um, and, and, and why that seam exists and, and why and how we can understand it better and, and, and what, what are the consequences of that, that artificial seam. Um, so that, that could preoccupies a lot of my time, even from a scientific standpoint. And then of course the rest of my time is uh, getting kids and wife and kids and spending time outdoors and doing wonderful things. It's all a very difficult balance. Um, I'm going to break this talk into up into three parts, and and you know, and we'll get into the to the nitty gritty here. There's a few big words and things, words you probably haven't heard much. Esesis is a word that I that I kind of dug up out of out of, out of obscurity, um, it, but it's basically holism, and we'll get into esesis and in, in the process uh, more in a little bit. First, in part one, I just want to kind of set the the concept of holism that that the, the the concept that the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. And I'm going to start that <laughs> with a video. Some, a lot of people see this video. It's been around forever. Um, but it's a, it's a decomposing fox time lapse, right? So there's going to be gross things. So if you don't want to see, <laughs> you know, it's close to Halloween. I thought, hey, this, this is in the spirit of Halloween. But there's going to be rapid decomposition and 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 maggots and things like that it's 30 seconds i'm gonna i'm gonna speed it up um but if you if you don't want to totally appreciate that and you but fair warning that it's it's kind of gross it's not, it's not horribly gross it's kind of beautiful really but if you're squeamish about rotting things you might just avert your eyes for for 30 seconds or so and i'm gonna turn the music off because it's kind of weird and i'm gonna speed it up to two times. I I like that video or this video. Um, Let's let's get past the the Facebook page now. Oh, we're stuck. Um, I, I like that. I like the video in in the sense that that it shows something we we often try to avoid, even in nature, is 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 death and and the recycling of ourselves back into the world. But it, but I think it highlights the the a holism and understanding of the the, the, the parts. The, the, the sum of the parts is that the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. Um, and, and I've got, I, I, I had a whole bunch of really dense info. So I just wrote it down and I'm going to basically read this as we go through some slides. Um, Cause I, otherwise I'll be drifting for an hour. So let me just kind of, kind of read as we go along here. Um, so we're made of pieces and we're made of parts. Living things are made up of parts. Like we saw in the Fox there. Um, but that's not who we are. We are we are that which emerges as sensations and feelings of the self in the now. So so where did the animated where does where did the animated self of the fox 
go. There's a we have a dead fox. It's rotting away. Uh, the foxiness is gone, but the parts of the fox remain. And in the video, we see the the parts be disassembled. But the self, the emergent property of living matter in a sequence of living history, um, where is that? Where's where's the fox in that? We see a dead fox, but that's not the fox. I can get where I'm going with this. Um, and and I, and I like that there's there's a there's a in, in theoretical physics there's this new concept called assembly theory and it's basically that that li even life itself is just the accumulation of sort of chemical reactions um, that you could never replicate like you could, we'll never have artificial life because life itself depends on the history of life building up to a certain point and envision a chemical reaction of a baking soda and vinegar. And the chemical reaction of baking soda and vinegar, like the volcanoes, you, know, you make it a science fair. Um, that reaction will keep going as long as you keep adding baking soda and vinegar. Uh, the, the reaction, the heat it produces, the noise, the motion, it's all energy being expressed. And that energy is, is, is the action of the reaction. It's, that's the show. So the, the baking powders doesn't do much. Is it relatively inert? The vinegar doesn't do much relatively inert, inert. The gases they produce, that's not really what you're there to see. It's that combination. It's that in the moment, flash in the pan. That's what's there. That's sort of analogous to the foxiness, to, 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 to the self, to the essence, to, the, to what is living when, when, life, you know, when life is gone and you're just left with the parts of a, of a decomposing fox. That's what's that's that's what is left the animation, if you will. Uh, animated life, the, our existence is, is not the parts that make us up or the products we produce, but it's expression of life in motion. It's the accumulation of sensations in the now that cannot be measured. So you, you can't measure these types of things. They can only be experienced. Then. Even as, even as botanists, you know, a lot of you, a lot of you botanical work the, or hang around botanists and speak botanist lingo, because people talk about being a gestalt botanist, just, just knowing stuff that is just, I know that's, I know this is a red oak because it just is, just the, because of the way it is. It's the, the, it's the whole of it is greater than some of its parts. You can pick out the details of bristles on the leaf tips and yada, yada, yada. But sometimes just looking at something, just is what it is. That's sort of the immeasurable experiential relationship um, that, we're, that we're talking about here. Uh, more simply, well, also going along with that is, is DNA records the information of existence over time. DNA is an information system that records histories, what, what works, what doesn't work, what adapts to omnipresent change. Um, and what doesn't adapt. More simply, this makes the, the accumulating, evolving existence an expression of information and matter over time. So, so life is matter, the stuff we're made up, the wood, the material, um, plus experience over, over time and experience is a, is a time phenomenon. And how do we capture that? And, and, and how do we ecologically understand that? Because you know, a dead fox is not necessarily the same as a living fox in an ecological sense. One's being disassembled. One is trying to stay assembled and live and, and, and is uh, interacting in different, they're, acting, they're interacting in the ecosystem in very different ways. Uh, the, uh, the, the now, that, that moment, that fleeting, moment that, that we're that we're always conscious of the, the moving now that fleeting impossible circle i, I like using the, the picture here where with this, this oh go ahead but I, i'm i'm catching a zoom thing <laughs> the uh you get the, the this impossible circle that that's sort of a, a zen mindfulness you, you get you get caught into these circles into this this awareness this is sort of nature, this perpetual thing that just sort of runs on its own over time. Um, 
when we deny that, when we deny that mindfulness, we deny that the living essence and anything that it entails to another person, another animal, another life form, a river, a rock, an atom, we ultimately deny it to ourselves. How do we know that? Because when we deny it at any level, it begins to, to disintegrate. When you ignore a house plant in your house and deny it water or deny it the right or just forget about it it will start to decompose and dis it will disintegrate it will it will disappear as soon as it's dead it will just break down and the matter the essence of what it was will be gone and the matter and the atoms of it will be recycled back into a living system um, so there's, there's a degree to which we can understand and appreciate and engage in the livingness of things and there's a point at which where we deny it we deny it ultimately to our to ourselves that it, it it literally is a sort of a when something loses its integrity it, it falls apart it disintegrates um if, if, if you folks if any folks anybody knows the the movie fantasia like the never-ending story um or the never ending story, the, the land of Fantasia is slowly disintegrating because children aren't reading, aren't using their imagination. Um, the, the, there's, there's, a, there's a kindness, there's a compassion, there's a patience, a giving, a sacrifice um, that's not necessarily spiritual or psychological, but really is ecological. There's an ecological relationship to patience, to compassion, to, to sort of the animated behaviors. We, we don't talk about behavior in ecology because science tends to deal with things that we can physically touch. But there are behavioral, these, these essences, the foxiness of that fox that once dead is no longer there, that what is missing from that piece that made it a different ecology is part of the system that we don't really deal with well because it is intangible. But but not dealing with that intangibility, ignoring that intangibility because we don't know how to deal with it, has ecological repercussions, and that's sort of sort of the gist of 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 where we're going with this. Then when we when we remove ourselves from that relationship, um, we alter the relationship. Sorry, I just got some pretty slides around there. Um, this is this is the nature of nature, and I'll, we'll get more into the details of this, and I'll and. This will be a little clearer as we move along and we'll give plant examples so don't worry uh, but we're, but when we when we when we don't engage with the system we start to disenfranchising ourselves from the system and we start not appropriately interacting with the system which is which is kind of where we are in in today's world where there's a disconnection with nature where we're not engaged in the system the, the fact that the ecological system around us is disintegrating is, is largely due to our lack of expanding and being consciously aware and engaged and caring enough to slow it down or to stop it, which basically means changing ourselves. Um, moving forward here, mostly slides from here on out. Uh, the world of wounds is something that comes up a lot in ecological circles, people I work with in, in, ecology, in the ecology realm often talk about a lot of you probably feel this way that oh when i was young i just loved nature and nature was beautiful and then the more i learned about it it's just depressing now and it's hard and it is we all deal with that that's there's a there's a psychological trauma when you love anything that you see damaged in certain ways elder leopold wrote about it in in santa county almanac one of the and he wrote one of the penalties of an ecological education is that one lives in a world of wounds and, and that's true. We feel those wounds. We feel that hurt. Robin, more recently, Rob, Robin, Kim, Robin, Robin Wall Kimmer and, and Braiding Sweetgrass kind of kind of re, uh, re, uh, re, uh, rebutted Leopold's uh, wounded world in the quote, even a wounded world is feeding us. Even a wounded world holds us, giving us moments of wonder and joy. I choose joy over despair, not because I have my head in the sand, good at sand, but because joy is what the earth gives me daily and I must return the gifts. So, so 
these are two ways of looking at the same thing, a world of wounds. And one of them is, is very scientific, very factual. Like we live in a world of wounds and it's, and it's hard. Then there's the Robin Wall camera perspectives. We live in a world of wounds, but I, I, I still have to have hope. I still have to live in you know, I, I think one of those, I think the, the camera angle gives us somewhere to build upon. It gives us a reason to try and to, to, to move a little harder. And I, and, I think, and I hope that's sort of a sign of a contemporary shift in conservation philosophies, but it may not be. Um, but because we're, we're all things are interwoven, all living things are interwoven, um, in their relationships, our ecological problems are really psychological problems. The, the reason we have ecological problems is because we aren't behaving and thinking about the world in appropriate ways. Um, if we wish to coexist better with, with the earth itself, with our local communities, whatever, we must be different than we are now to make things better. We must understand something that we don't right now. Uh, by the very nature of this, what we need to do will seem strange. So I, 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 think, I think that's kind of one of the hard parts of moving forward in like conservation and with uh, you know, regenerative agriculture or, or whatever it might be is that we, we want to move forward, but we don't quite, I think most people don't realize we, there's not a conscious awareness that, oh, I have to actually be very different and that's going to feel strange to me, it's that strangeness, that cognitive dissonance that ultimately keeps people from 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 changing, from from moving forward. Um, but ultimately, one of those big gaps I think that a lot of people have to to get over and the big hurdles is the notion that nature does not exist. We live in a society that that constantly separates us from nature. Well, that's nature. That's a natural area. That's a park. That's a state park. Uh, that's the woods. This is this is the city. That's not the nature, but that's purely an imaginary construct that doesn't exist. There is no such thing as nature. We are an interwoven landscape of things that when I flush my toilet, it doesn't go to just the human places. It eventually ends up in a river. So, I, I, you know, the, the cars, the, the exhaust from my car doesn't stick to the human world. It, it falls within. And the bird songs that I hear as I walk out the, outside the door aren't just the nature's bird songs. Those are just bird songs. And I am part of that system. And nature is part of that system. Um, it is all one thing, is, is ultimately, it, which is obvious, right? But I think consciously embracing that means something different taking that step and fully understanding that changes you in a little bit. It, it'll seem strange, but there's a cognitive dissonance there that a lot of people are resistant to, which brings us to the concept of ecesis, which is the title of the talk. Ecesis, you know, ecology, that first, that EC of ecology, and then the ology. So ecos is home, ology is the study of ecesis, is again ecos home and then cis using words of like is uh it's, it's the process of um like uh metamorphosis is the prof process of metamorphosizing um ecesis is the process of coming home the process of becoming home and it's it's a it's an obscure ecological term but it's ironic because it's the exact ecological term that we need it should be forefront in our vernacular not something that's lost in obscurity. Um, it's it's basically naturalizing when, or it's I mean, we, we we whether it's romantic or not. Uh, sort of people living in tune with nature. Picture that you know, not agriculture, pre-agricultural societies, living and 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 engaging in a landscape. That's more of an ascesis relationship, where there's a reciprocity. There's giving and a taking. Um, so that ascesis is a naturalization. It's a process that everything, including ourselves, go to. We talk about eventually humans pushing the natural world, there we go again, the natural world, too far and destroying things. It's ultimately, it's ultimately going to come back on us. I mean, there's be a lot of collateral damage along the way. Um, but eventually, 
the laws of checks and balances do engage them. But we can only we can only have that ecesis through a compassionate regenerative consciousness. We have to be aware. We have to we have to understand what that does. We have to care whether a prairie gets plowed. We have to pray. We have to care whether our sewage dumps into a river. There has to be a compassionate regenerative consciousness, a consciousness that says this is not sustainable and it doesn't engage accurately. Therefore, it is wrong, regardless of the compromises. Uh, this requires listening to the existence of existences around us. It, it requires an engagement. Again, a strangeness, even for me, um, an openness. It requires a conscious, respectful, intentional, mindful in interaction. And I, and I give this sort of talk to, to nature loving people in general, and a lot of us feel like we're there, but I don't think we're even there. I don't think, I don't think the most nature loving of nature lovers is quite as engaged as we ultimately need to be. Uh, and, and I'm talking about reaching out to plants, not simply admiring the beauty of plants, but acknowledging our need for their help and their understanding. But if we expanded that conscious awareness to every living thing, you know, the squirrel in your yard has as much rights as your dog, or as you, you know, the plants in your yard have rights and have the the have their own futures and their own relationships. That seems weird, right? But it's gonna have to feel weird for it to work. And ultimately it would work. Imagine a world where all those where all living things were given respect and rights and protected, we would not all the problems that we have would would, would sort of vanish. Now, of course, that's not an easy fix. We're not gonna instantly go do that. But that's the kind of relationship. That's the way we should start engaging and start thinking about these sort of relationships, this reciprocity, this equality, this compassion, a, a shared reason and a shared passion for existence. Um, in Eastern philosophy, there's there's a term namaste that, that you hear uh, people say, and it's sort of a greeting uh, um, of sorts, amongst other things. But it literally means the light in me acknowledges the light in you and that light that we're talking about is what the fox was lacking in that video that light was gone and now it's just pieces parts there's a living essence in me there's a living essence in all of you there's a living essence in the fox and in the plants in my yard and in the mites in my eyebrows these things have living essence that when we ignore we probably ignore at our peril um and we, we, we do that to sort of keep it a distance. There's many reasons why we may, we may do that. But even though we do that, a lot of people of us, especially nature lovers, engage in that. There's levels of it to which we, we could engage even deeper. And I, and I like the image here of this. I think it's a, I don't know, non-North American animals. Well, but I think it's a, it's a, it's a, a water buffalo or, or a, something something of that of that uh, nature and then of course these birds are preening it and we see similar things with bison in in north america right they're they're like cowbirds ecologically cowbirds groom bison and, and, and this is kind of a good example of how how well two things it's, a, it's basically a plant talk but i got these animals on here but again that that animal and those birds are as much plants as plants are. Everything they eat is plant. The cow's eating plants, you are what you eat, right? So when we see an animal, it's not a separate thing. It's it's an expression of plantsness of some form. These birds are an expression of, of plants as expressed through this, this large, magnificent animal. Um, we miss those relationships, and especially in a fragmented landscape. The second point I wanted to make was that Cowbirds, you know, people, if you know cowbirds, you know what they're notorious for. They're, they're called nest parasites. Uh, they, they lay eggs in other birds' nests, and those other birds un, unknowingly raise cowbird babies, and the cowbirds off, you know, in, in everybody's imagination, it's like off to the Florida Keys drinking margaritas and living the salt life that you hear about. Um, that's that's 
somewhat what is happening, but in a historic landscape, cowbirds migrated with bison as, as throughout the summer as, as rain patterns sh shifted. Bison herds, massive herds were largely migrating across the Great Plains and cowbirds were on the move and they preened bison. They keep, they do like these birds here, they pick ticks and fleas and things off of them and they keep the bison kind of clean. They can't nest long because they're on the move. They're following the bison. So they lay their eggs in prairie birds' nests that are there, do, that, are, that are sedentary life, right? But the bison are creating structure that benefits the non-cowbird birds. So all of a sudden you start really start seeing this as a relationship of cowbirds tending bison that are tending a prairie that are being utilized by other birds and that, that, the, that the positive aspect comes back probably, or it must, to the non-cowbird birds. And so is this really a parasitism? Not necessarily. So, so cowbirds get a, bad, get a bad rap, but they are engaged in this compassionate, this, this interrelated system that we're gonna get into in depth here in a minute. So if we need regenerative cultures, which we do, uh, and if they are to live in regenerative communities, which they must, then we must have a regenerative consciousness. We have to have a way of thinking about these things and we have to have a way to ensure it and measure it. And this is where the botany comes in. And this is what science ultimately is, is, is supposed to do. It's why we have science. It, it tells us how to engage, how to move forward. What's the best way path? What's the best path forward for us to persist in a living landscape. So this is a, oh, I forget the name. It's one of the prairies in, uh, in the Arkansas Valley, uh, east of Fort Smith, near Charleston, Arkansas. Um, but beautiful prairie, one of my favorite prairies in, in the country, it's just gorgeous. That looks like a wonderful place. This is a, is a different prairie. This is a Missouri, don't worry. Uh, this one has been abused pretty heavily and most of the plants there are like uh, Ubatorium perfoliatum, uh, common bone set, and lots of sumac. These are two very different places. I'll go back and forth a little bit. Uh, that mean very different ecological things. Here's another example. Here's a nice, uh, this, is a, this is near the Arkansas border of Missouri. This is a nice sort of glade woodland combo. If you guys, if you're ever out in nature, these are one of my favorite places where you, it's kind of a, it's kind of a glade marbling into a woodland, man, the, the, the plants and the richness and the insects, everything just really comes together in those, those beautiful mixed communities. Um, this not so much, you know, <laughs> here, here you've got kind of some, uh, it's an old log landing. That's a different system. So we all know, that is a thing. So knowing that there are different ways that nature can exist, different form, different states of quality, let's learn and we'll move into like into part two, which is floristic quality assessment. So how do we determine what is good? If we're going to, if we're going to have regenerative communities, if we're going to have regenerative cultures, if we're going to have regenerative consciousness, how are we going to measure that moving forward? Can we measure that moving forward? Um, we know that communities are different, and we also know that plants are different. There are different types of species. On the, on the left in red, you have sort of, these are simplicicals, I call them. They're annual plants, they're scab plants. I don't use the word weed. I'm trying to take that out of my, out of my language because I, I just don't think it has much use. Um, it's derogatory. Um, but simplicicals, these are, these, are, these are scab plants. These are, these are early successional species um, in terms of plants. Um, they are they 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 occur in landscapes that have been damaged or impacted. They're short lived. They're fast growing. They're mostly annuals, some biennials. They produce a lot of seed, and those seeds disperse very long distances. Everything about these plants is a very short life span. And picture an intact historic landscape, a landscape that looks like this and this, not a landscape that looks like this and this in that intact landscape historically that what these organisms evolved into um to find a beat up tilled up damaged landscape 
you would have to grow really quickly, produce a whole lot of seeds and throw those, shoot those seeds across a landscape shotgun style that hopes that one in a million finds a tip up mound, um, maybe a tornado path, you know, nature is full of enough chaos and randomness that, that, it, that it's there because these things do exist, but they're only like 10% of any given flora, these sort of annual uh, simple species, these, these scab sort of spe species. On the other end of that spectrum, you have these complexicals. Um, the, these are long lived old growth species. They live in complex systems. They have very low nitrogen requirements. Um, they're sensitive highly specialized species. They live for a long time, they grow slowly, they don't produce very many seeds, their seeds usually don't disperse very far, they stay local because the landscape up until a few hundred years ago in North America was relatively stable. You didn't want to disperse. If you, if you were a long lived perennial species and the system was not changing, you didn't wanna go anywhere. Most of the system didn't change, didn't go anywhere. In, in the past 200 years, we've flipped that upside down. We've flipped the landscape into mostly a, an abused landscape and put these complexicals, these old growth species, we put them uh, at, a, at a major disadvantage. Um, think of that as two ends of a spectrum. Then we're going to put that on a graph here. So you have unstable communities on a zero end and old growth species, old growth stable communities uh on the right side there and a spectrum of zero to ten we can assign the species that tend to occur in those systems on that value and that's what the fluoristic quality assessment is arkansas is i don't know if it's out yet but arkansas is in the process or very soon or recently has gotten fluoristic quality assessment c values are, are often what they're called where each species, each native species is assigned to values, a number zero to 10 that represents its fidelity to intact natural systems. So basically how old growthy or new growthy is, is this thing? Does it like disturbed areas? Or is it like high quality stable areas that haven't changed for millennia? Um, that's, that's, so in what we find in this system is that most, most species in a given flora, a good 80% of a flora is in that, in that three to seven range. Most species, your big blue stem in a prairie, your little blue stem in a prairie, uh, white oaks in a, in a woodland, post oaks, depending on where you are. Um, those, those sort of species are in that four to five range. It's the blue collar workforce. They could take a little impact, but they're largely persistent and living. We'll, we'll, let's run through a a series of them. So here's a here's burnweed. Some people call it fireweed. Erectites heracifolia is one of these C values zero. So it's a produces a whole lot of seeds after some sort of damage. Not always fire logging and things will make it express as well. Basically, what makes it express is nitrogen. Any any anything on that scab plant on that low C value range are nitrophilous species, and anything that damages a system expresses nitrogen and that's basically what they're not basically they are literally keying in on nitrogen when when a when a dandelion seed is dispersing across a landscape it's looking for a nitrogen place to land not an old growth system to land in um so those are C, those are zeros Things like blackberries, there's a C value of two. So still kind of, you know, an old field, something that's not a stable old growth system, something that's reverting back to a stable system, but isn't like recently plowed or horribly damaged. Blackberries are in that sort of C value two range. But again, they, they like nitrogen, they grow very really tough and they often need a lot of light and they make a lot of seeds and they disperse those seeds by things eating them and pooping them across the landscape. That's how they how they move. And their seeds like like the like Eric Tides, the the burnweed, these sort of species, their seeds bank for a very long time. As you move up the C value scale, seeds bank less and less or less less resilient to uh to fungal and Fungal, fun, fun, fungus end up eating most seeds that disperse in, in seed banks. Uh, so if you're going to last a long time in a seed bank, you got to have a pretty hard shell. Moving up that system a little bit, you got Andropogon scoparius, little blue stem, 
uh, C value five. Again, a moderate generalist, but it's the backbone of, of, of grassland systems, many grassland systems. Disperses by wind, yes, but doesn't make a whole lot of seed in the seed where it does land. Doesn't do well unless there's low nitrogen systems. Uh, con converse to this, like if you know broom sedge, Andropogon virginicus, uh, that's a seed value of two. That makes more seed. They disperse a little longer, and it's it's only going to germinate in systems that have higher nitrogen and are lower on the successional gradient. Moving up the the scale, a seed value six, Indian paintbrush, Castilleja coccinea. Uh, here's something that you know we're also increasing in complexity. So here's an organism that needs relatively low vegetation structure, low nitrogen, but also has to be able to attach and connect because it's a hemiparasite. So it's connecting to other things. All of a sudden its life isn't just its own. It needs other things to be involved, kind of like the cowbird does. It's a, it's a, it's a member of a community, not a standalone entity. And, and that's what we see as we move up the system. A, a, a higher C value, the more dependency on other on the community itself which is which is kind of the point we're getting at here is a c-value system is being analogous to sort of a human system if you will cyberpidium regine the showy lady slipper c-value 10 so you're not going to find this you know some the farmer plows up his field you're not going to walk out and find a bunch of cyberpidium regine growing in it if you find cyperpidium, find showy lady slipper, it's probably going to be a seepy old fin that's been seeping for a thousand years and it's been there forever. Um, these are these are unchanged, low nitrogen. If you want to change that system, take a nice stick of fin like that where the cyperpidium is growing, dump a bunch of nitrogen in it, and you will destroy it overnight. Just the presence of nitrogen, these plants, it's it's toxic to them. Plants that occur in these old growth systems will die, and it'll be it'll be full of all kinds of low C value species. All, all it takes is that one, you know, available nitrogen. So that's that's kind of the spectrum there. And so when we when we do that in a, in a landscape, we can apply. Um, I'm going to flip back. We can apply those C values. The numbers themselves are rather subjective. You know, people argue between fives and sixes. But when we average those numbers and kind of take out some of that error, the average number of any given place, so a plot, especially like at a, a sampling, a, a plot of land or a, a quadrat level, quadrat sampling, the average number, usually like in a really super high quality area, you're looking at somewhere between four and five is the average C value for those systems, for, for high quality intact systems. But you get below like three and a half and you get really damaged system. If you get an average C value of two and a half, it's barely even worth restoring. Um, almost never do you see C value, um, average C value for a site over five, um, just because that's just the nature of, of systems. Life is sometimes stable, just like in your own personal life. Sometimes things are going great and everything's stable. Now, some days things get a little rough and rocky. You know, you're never, you're never perfectly where you want to be, but you find you find a little happiness there in the middle. Take the good, you take the bad, right? It's the facts, it's the facts of life. Uh, research is ritual. For if we're going to engage in communities, we're going to engage in sort of this relationship. We have to also realize that our research is ritualistic. We have methodologies we follow. We have scripts. We have things we say and things we write down. I, I think it's funny to think of research as being ritualistic. Um, all that's missing is sort of the actual reverence for for the uh, for the for the for the study the study material. You know, and scientifically, of course, we're or barred from having any sort of engagement emotionally or or otherwise with with living systems so it's not ritualistic in that sense but it is ritualistic in pretty much any other sense we do pretty goofy things and say pretty goofy things and have have cult-like phenomena ex behavioral expressions when we do research as a, as a researcher i guarantee you it, it gets a little silly um but that is that is a but you know, why don't we? Why don't we engage in this in sort of a way? Because it's what it is. We're, we're experiencing a landscape so that we understand the landscape so that we can engage with the landscape. All we need to do is just listen, maybe with our hearts a little more than our minds, which is what we're not supposed to do, but ultimately is what we have to do if we want to engage functionally with a living system. 
And I want to give an example of that. Here's here's data. Here's an example of data we collect. I don't want to get into the nuts and bolts. It's not important. But we do these square plots. They're 100 paces by 100 pace. Um, and we do 25 quarter meter quadrats. You can see the, the two folks digging in a, in a white PVC frame, write down all the species, write down their cover values, do that 25 times across a grid pattern. And then we get average C values. We get the number of species in that, in that site. Uh, we get a bunch of data from that that we can interpret. That's that we get the product of that ritual is things that we have to, to interpret what they mean in the same way that flipping tarot cards, the medium has to decide what they mean. That hopefully our, you know, this is a little more based on repeatable patterns, but you never know. There's still interpretation either way. I'm going to say that. Uh, the main things we look at, the, so this is done by, by all kinds of, of, of conservation and research organizations. And the main variables that we look at for plants is diversity, richness, and dominance. Diversity is how plants are distributed. Richness is the number. Dominance is like if you're in a prairie, big blue stem, little blue stem tend to be the, the sort of the backbone, the matrix, they, they be the more dominant species. And then other things kind of, you know, it's their world, other things fit in it. When we do that in prairies, this is, this is data from prairies in Missouri. So this is real data. Each one of these dots is a, a, a plot from a different prairie. And when we graph them, so on the bottom is diversity. That's the distribution of species, how mixed up they are. And on the left, on the on the on the y-axis, we have the number of species. That's just literally that's richness. How many species are there? So when we when we increase in the number of species, we tend to get a blending of species. That's just a, a well-known fact um, in in nature. Um, so like if you're on the bottom left, you're on the left of that line. You're at a place that has only sixty species, and the diversity is like. 3.3, 3. 3. whereas on the left end of that, you're up to 100 species. Well, wow, that's a lot of species. And the diversity, you know, the numbers aren't really intuitive. The diversity is, is 4.2. Um, just understand that that's higher. Um, so that's, that's how diversity and richness, and these are variables that people look, use all the time. But notice that I colored two, the two highest dots. Which, which of the two best periods? I, I, I dot, I colored a red and a black dot um, on the graph there. And so which, which, which of all of these, blue, red, or, or black is the best two prairies? And I, I took liberties because I'm leading you on, um, which, was, which are the best. People would look at this and say, oh, yeah, those two prairies, the red one and the black one, those are the best prairies. Look how, look how high the richness is and look how high the diversity is. That's what we want. Um, dominance is, is sort of the other thing. So here you've got the distrib you got diversity still on the x-axis, and on the y-axis we have the cover of dominant species. So as you move left or right, um, the more the the more distributed species are, the less any one dominates, which is just common sense. Um, you know, it, on the left, up high on the left. Um, those plots up there, the two top left blue dots, those are those have like that's percentages. So they're near forty five percent. So this is a prairie. So that's about forty five percent dominant species, probably little blue stem. And when that happens, you don't have a whole lot of other species mixed in. Conversely, on the bottom right, the black and red dots, that's low dominance but higher diversity, which is ultimately what you want. You want little blue stem to be down in that like twenty percent range. Um, so other things can coexist if we're managing for systems. And so which are the two best prairies? Uh, red and black fall in there. Again, you, you, there's a blue one there that's close that you could pick. But again, I'm leading you on. So red and black prairies. So we decided that the red, if we had to choose the two best prairies, we had a million dollars and we could save two prairies. Those would be the two to save. And the rest, tough luck, buddy. We're buying these two. We're saving them. Um, but wait a minute. When you go out to those two prairies, you say, I'm not sure what's going on here. Here's one of them. One of them looks like this. You're like, okay, yeah, that's that's a really great looking prairie. That's good. Let's save it. Then you go to the next one, it looks like this. And you're like, well, wait a minute. These aren't the same thing at all. But numerically, these are often the same thing is what I'm ultimately getting at here is that 
the when you just look at diversity, the number of species and richness and their cover values, you don't really get the whole picture. But when we throw in the variable of floristic quality, which is the average C value, this is what happens. So the mean Z value, that's the average C value on the X axis, and then diversity on the Y axis, the red and blue split on opposite ends of the spectrum. And when we do that with richness, on the y-axis, same thing. And when you do it with dominance, it's, it's, it's inverted, but it's the same. You get this bell-shaped curve or this, this curvilinear relationship. It's not a, so two things are happening here. Those two prairies are now on opposite ends of what's good and what's bad. And the other thing is we don't have a linear relationship. We have a curvilinear relationship, which makes things difficult. Um, but basically what it, the, the point here is that when you put in floristic quality, you see that systems are not always the same by ri richness and diversity are not good gauges. You have to have a quality variable. You have to have, it's a, here's, a, here's a great example. If I, I told you I'd sell you a hundred cars for a hundred bucks, the first thing you wanna know is what kind of cars are they? This system doesn't tell us what kind of cars they are. It just says cars. Uh, when we put apply an equality variable through C values, we can say, oh, okay, these are good, these are bad. Um, that's the beauty of, of Florida quality assessment. Um, and so applying that, you know, we, we discovered this, I discovered this in, in data a good 10 years ago, and, it, and it's changed my life because it's, it, it's, it's not a variable that was known. Um, it opens up many ecological doors. And as we started putting more data and data data to it, we start realizing that, that, that these relationships, these trough like on the top graphs there, those U-shape uh, relationships aren't to just U-shape. There's there's a relationship where there's a buildup, then a decline, and then a buildup. And that's that's a successional gradient. Um, so C value, low C value. If you took a if you took a prairie and plowed up an acre in the middle of a high quality prairie just down to bare dirt, it would start with zero plants. But over time, because it's in an intact system, it would in, it would climb from the bottom left there up to the first peak. Whoops, touch my screen. Um, and at that point, that's when perennial species that that first that early successional the dashed line there that peak. Uh, when it gets to about that point, you've got a certain number of species of annual species, they start getting replaced by perennials and things which outcompete um, the annuals. You'll see a decrease in richness and diversity down into this trough. And then as um, more later successional, the sensitive species, you know, this could take thousands of years, orchids and things like that start coming in, you start getting an increased richness and diversity again. And then ultimately that's what late successional systems are. They're, they're that second peak. That's an experiential relationship. It has, it, it's a lot of things. It's, it's a mean C value, average C value. It's also a nitrogen scale, high nitrogen on the left, low nitrogen on the right. There's a resilience and a persistence. There's a connectivity. As you move from left to right, the system becomes more complex. There's a shared experience. That's what a community is, a building system of, you know, the, the soil evolves, the system evolves, new species come and go. From left to right, you're building complexity. You're also building predictability and early successional species. You have no idea where it's going to go, what species are going to colonize it, what tomorrow is going to bring. Late successional species, you know what tomorrow is going to be. It's going to be just like today, most likely. You never know for sure. Um, but that's that's that that's that. Those, these are the things you want in your life. These are the things you want in your community. You want stability. You want relation. You want connectivity. You want persistence. Um, and and these are all products of time and experience together. Um, it's chaotic complexity versus organized complexity, again, which is a, a product of time and experience together. Okay, so that's the kind of more science-y end. I'm gonna tie everything kind of together here towards the end in, in part three. This is a dynamic functional, a dynamically functional interpretation of existence. The thesis is, is the process of coming home. We, we have, you know, we, we moved into part two because we needed a way to measure, how do we measure our relationship? 
how do we ask plants? How do we ask nature, the natural world around us, whether we're doing a good job or not? Floristic quality assessment allows us to do that. It gives us numbers back. We collect information. We ask it. We perform the ritual. We ask why, what it needs and what's going on. We get data back that says the system isn't stable enough. Um, and if we, if we increase the stability in that system, then we're engaging appropriately. We're listening to it and responding to it respectfully um, and engaging with the system. This is, this is the sort of thing that's going to have to be the new indigenous relationship, the new indigenous knowledge in our systems. We don't live off the land and don't engage that way. So our engagement is going to have to be informational. It's going to have to be relational. Um, and this is sort of a, a tool that at least gets us in that direction. Hopefully it, it becomes more than that. But this isn't just a, a relationship that is found in plants and then fl the floristic quality. This relationship, this floristic integrity curve, I'll go back to it, this, this S-shaped, N-shaped curve is in a lot of things in nature, um, uh, cycles and technology. They call them when something comes out, something new comes out, the technological advancement, fashion, it's all the rage, it peaks in its performance, and then it kind of tapers off. Uh, and then over time, maybe it kind of comes back over time. Bitcoin's a good example. Bitcoin was big technology, was a new thing. People invested in it. Over time, it lost money. And it's kind of maybe coming, you don't know, maybe it's going to come back. But some sort of, these, this is how technologies and things work. Sometimes they fail, sometimes they don't. Um, a better example maybe is the Dunning-Kruger effect of, of a relationship between confidence and knowledge, wisdom and knowledge. Um, when So you got wisdom on the x-axis on the bottom, you got confidence low and high. When you're, you know, when you don't know a whole lot, you're kind of confident about, oh, I could do that. I've seen people play football. That doesn't, I've seen professional, those guys make a million dollars. I could do that. Um, but you know, but you go out and try, when you start to do it, you try to apply it, you quickly realize, oh, I'm not quite what I thought I was going to be going to be down in the valley of despair here. And over time, wisdom, you, you mature. This is, a, this is just a normal maturation process. Here's another example uh, of like human, you know, children, confidence, think things kind of easy, you age a little bit, you realize life's kind of hard, and then you spend your grown up years maturing and learning uh, what life actually is. These, these are the relationships that you have to go through that anybody goes through. If you, uh, you know, if you want to take up piano or guitar, you're like, oh, maybe I could do it. You get into it, you realize how hard it is. If you stick with it, you can gradually improve over time. But there's that there's that shattering of what you thought was going to happen to what actually is how things happen that people have to go through. There's that learning phase, and we talk about it a lot. It's fun that ecologically that's how systems work. Systems have to mature. A prairie is a product of this. A you know a a nice a high quality woodland if you're doing a restoration if you're trying to convert a fescue field into into high quality or into some sort of pollinator friendly uh, landscape this is not only your engagement with that but that that system's going to have to engage it'll start off very low c value weedy sort of stuff three or four years later you start seeing some big blue stem and it'll start maturing into a system give that thing a couple hundred years and it'll be a prairie again that's that relationship it, it's a it's a repeating pattern in life itself and you could throw that on a, on a scale on that left in on the left hand side there are things like fear ignorance selfishness immaturity anger confusion you don't know what tomorrow's going to bring you don't know what to do everything's happening very fast it's very confusing on the right end of that spectrum is compassion wisdom community patience forgiveness predictability the sort of desirable things that we ultimately want, that stability that we want, whether it's in our lives or in our ecological systems. This is the point where we where we get to engage and realize that we are the same thing, that, that how we inter interact and how we feel is the same way that systems interact and all living things interact and all living things feel. That feeling, that engagement, that essence is the thing that the fox in the video no longer had. It's just pieces, parts. 
but there's something beyond that. And so, you know, this graph works scientifically. It works from the pieces parts. I can make matter. I can collect data from living things and make it have this relationship. But that relationship is a product of how those things are, not what they are, but how they are. Um, so it's, it's, it's fun to have sort of a scientific tool that we can engage with that way. Another example of that is there's a thing called Maslow's hierarchy of needs, which is a pyramid of you know, what you ultimately ultimately need to persist and be a happy functioning human. At the bottom, you need a place to sleep, you need some food, you need some water. Moving up to the red zone, you need some form of employment, some health, some family. Moving up, some friendships, some sexual intimacy. Moving up, some confidence, respect, and respected by others, some sort of just status, you know? And at the very top is just art and, and morality, creativity, spontaneity. This is a this is the this isn't this is a time scale relationship. And I've drawn on the right, I took liberties here and made early successional communities are just that they're food and water. Late successional communities are art and 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 uh, creativity things like that you can you can actually kind of i've done this just because it's for fun but it is kind of a relationship if you had a time variable the maslow's hierarchy of needs because it is a time variable it would be it wouldn't be a pyramid it would be a tilted pyramid which kind of fits the floristic integrity curve the the, the floristic quality assessment data which has a time variable that x-axis could be state stability over time so re revisiting ecesis, revisiting this concept, ecesis is a process of coming home, knowing home for the first time again. Um, and it's going to happen. It's only going to happen through compassionate, regenerative consciousness. That consciousness comes from listening to the existence of existences around us. We can't listen with our ears. We got to listen with data and with understanding and with, with some, some you know, real compassion. Um, it requires consciousness, respectfulness, intentionally mindful interactions, uh, reaching out to plants, not simply to admire them, but also to acknowledge our need for their help and their understanding. What they need is what we need. And as soon as we can match those things up, when our nature can match the nature, we can, we can engage uh, in, a, in a functional way. That's the reciprocity we're talking about. And that's, that's acknowledging the light that's having the light in us to acknowledge the light in the living things around us. Um, and then wrapping up here, I'm gonna read a little bit again. I, and, and, I, and I say this because you know, as a scientist, this is, these are, I'm treading thin ice here, right? You can probably hear it in my voice. I'm like, I don't want to go too far over a line that we in the scientific world do not ever cross because that's sort of a, religious frou-frou goofy sort of line but we have to cross that line because that line is not there that's a fake line it's what's preventing us from actually getting anywhere we have to accept that there is an emotional relationship that the dead fox isn't the live fox because it because the 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 emotion is gone when we when we insist that those are separate through our science we only generate more death and more destruction we make a bunch of dead foxes we can't animate them unless we let them be alive and we can't let them be alive unless we accept that living and being is actually 90 percent of what it's all about so so, so we, we and and so it becomes sort of this weird line of like, are we crossing into the unscientific, into the unreal? Is this is this just ideal? Oh, this is just a bunch of ideal idealism. It's, oh yeah, it's, those are great ideals, but they're not factual in nature. When in fact they are factual in nature. And the very the very you know, science is defined as I've written here. Science is defined by unimaginable constraints all the time. By definition, things that never actually occur. These idealized sort of fantastical imaginary things. Hardy-Weinberg theorem, if you, if you know about Hardy-Weinberg theorem, is a genetic thing that in a perfect, in a vacuum species genetic purport, the, the allele frequencies within populations, the gene frequencies would assemble into, into this perfect relationship of, of um, if, if, a, if, if a species were in a completely unselected world, 
but no species is in an unselected world. So Hardy Weinberg never happens, but we use it to gauge how things are shifting and what, what evolutionary pressures are. Consciousness, what is it? Where is it? How, where does it come from? It's a thing that where we live with all the time, but it is a thing, but we don't know what to do with it. We don't know how to define it. There's, there's 50 books written on what is consciousness, the absolute zero, mathematical sort of thing. Infinity, again, does it exist? Planck distance, an, an infinitely small distance, uh, an ever-expanding universe, that's, that's kind of out there. The inexceedable speed of light, Schrodinger's cat, entropy, statistical randomness, chaos theory, the heat death of the universe. These are things that form our philosophical understanding of the world because the math and the science only function in light of them. Uh, life and living systems have this, uh, there's an imaginary quality, there's an idealism without which compassion and caring, without without pushing, without these things, without this otherness to the systems and without it in our science, our science is never going to match up with what's actually happening in the world. And that's, that's not, I think we fear that that's sort of, a, some people might fear that that's kind of getting into a woo spiritual sort of end, but I would contend that maybe those are, maybe the woo spiritual end is just a manifest manifestation of things that are just inherent to the universe. And we've just secondarily have called it that. Maybe we, maybe we need to take it back as this is real science. Um, so um, there's these paradoxical relationships, there's this difficulty, but it's it's not only not only these they not only simultaneously defy and define life, the paradoxes they create are in fact life itself. And that engagement with that wonder within that with that with that confusion, with that uneasiness. Is ultimately where we need to go if we're going to make things any better. And I'm done. Thank you. Wow. Thank you. Thank you, Justin. That was awesome. Uh, I really enjoyed that. Good. Very Some very deep stuff. Uh, I really enjoy when, you, you know, someone can combine uh, nature and science with the more deeper philosophical um, uh, sort of, you know, thoughts and, you know, bringing in some of the Eastern uh, religion yeah. and all of that so yeah, yeah i re really enjoyed that uh Thank you. If, if anyone has any questions or anything they'd like to bring up or talk about uh, now would be the time feel free to unmute your microphone and chime in uh, we're open to having a discussion and i'll, I'll just kind of start something off uh, have you ever read uh john burroughs uh you know are you familiar with john burroughs back in the 1800s uh, like a naturalist kind of a contemporary of john muir i've not read any of john burroughs but okay about, yeah well you know most of his stuff is uh you know involving natural history and his observations and stuff like that but he had one book that was uh, published posthumously in 1920 21 called um accepting the universe and it wow. was just filled with his philosophy of nature uh, and oh. i always highly recommend it uh it was something i read uh, sometime in my 20s and huh. you know he, he even you know brings in like pantheism and huh. um and, and talks about you know just a, like a, kind of a philosophy of nature um yeah. and you know i've always just kind of really appreciated uh some of the the thoughts he had in there but it um it's amazing how much of that there is that I, it, I don't know, it doesn't get shared around and maybe it's, you know what I mean? Like, like uh, even Schrodinger, mm -hmm. Schrodinger was a, was a physicist in the twenties and thirties, one of the big ones, uh, Nels Bohr, mm -hmm. um, all these guys with, with like quantum mechanics. And when they started learning like the, the, the atomic nature of the universe, it all it Quantum. freaked them out yeah, yeah. they all wrote books of like like <laughs> schrodinger wrote a book called what is life yeah and, <laughs> and he goes in these like hey this is this is weird like there's more going on here bored yeah. I mean, these are like these aren't just science guys these are like math i mean they don't do anything i mean guys that can't even tie their own shoes but sure they, yeah they can, they can solve the <laughs> equation on the planet all of their like, intelligence uh, got put into one part of their brain and, yeah. <laughs> exactly yeah it's like, well but you never hear about that but you you know even einstein you know einstein gets a little more more of that because I mean, maybe he was mm -hmm. more of a, a pop culture icon but you know right yeah stuff like, you know, that einstein stuff like these are 
these people, and it's kind of funny because physicists are kind of allowed to cross that line, but but mm-hmm. but it's weird that that you can't do it as a as an ecologist, uh, mm-hmm. which you think would be more appropriate. I mean, you think about like when they talk about in quantum mechanics, like spooky action at a distance, you yep. know, and just, exactly. you know, there's some layers here that we don't, you know, it's not yeah. space isn't what we think it is. That two things yeah. might be right by each other in some level, but yeah. very far away in the level that we experience, you know, and yeah. so it's, you know, it just kind of opens up all kinds of thoughts of, you know, just, yeah. you know, what really is going on here. And, and I think the more that science is starting to even, uh, develop evidence at least you know for our modern minds you know this are, these are things that were, were more intuited i think uh by earlier societies or observed in some cases perhaps yep. uh, but how plants are communicating you know and um, yeah. other yeah. non um non-animal life forms on earth uh, are able to yep. you know did, you know pick up on their surroundings and you know have some yep. what would you know by in um um you know be, be potentially you know a consciousness you know or some sort of um you know just because it's not and i bring up there's a really great youtube video um and it was a panel discussion at the world science festival uh and it's uh what is it called um like intelligence without brains i think and they have some of the Uh leading scientists that have studied uh like the uh some of the guys that uh, one of the guys that did uh, the studies on slime molds and their ability to problem solve yep. um something uh the lady that did the studies on the trees in the up, up in the northwest uh pacific northwest area with the, you yep. know, the tree the mothering behavior and yep. uh, you know and all, you know different there was one guy that was like studying like uh, hives and whether they be beehives ant hives and you know just just you know, putting forth the, the idea that you know these are species that have figured out how to distribute the brain or the intelligence among different mm-hmm. individuals mm-hmm. instead of it being all in one individual and so when one yeah. individual dies it doesn't kill the whole intelligence you know sure. and so it just really starts to make you get out of that not even anthropocentric but animal centric yeah. idea of what intelligence is yeah. you know that you know there's and then it makes me wonder if we ever found uh, alien life forms would we recognize it if we can't <laughs> right now recognize right. a slime mold as being having some level of intelligence would yeah. we recognize something that evolved completely different you know yeah it could be staring us in the face and we wouldn't uh yeah the, the could, lady that the, the, there's a physicist the uh, named uh, sarah walker that does mm-hmm. a, a assembly theory and one of her other things is is, is that is that question like well what would is what would artificial intelligence look like um or not our, what would alien intelligence what would alien life look like given yeah. how, given how how biased we are in, in our understanding here on 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 her but but you're right in the sense that we we keep reinventing these concepts they keep they won't go away and it's and it's and then i think science forever has kind of tried to repress them but I, I think they're coming out in creative ways i hope they are yeah uh you know and it just kind of goes to show a little bit of that cultural interplay between science and culture you know mm-hmm. I think, you know there is a lot of cultural and culture infused into scientific understanding sometimes yeah uh, which is, and i don't think we're always aware of that yeah and and as an ecologist you know i've i've been working on these sort of relationships and these ideas and we have we've had plurals of quality assessment for a long time and i can't unsee the system and you know when you walk out into place it starts humming you, you almost feel like it's avatar sort of relationship. <laughs> yeah. and then but then but then academic ecology and sort of the academic you know the 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 drivers of the actual field are very lab based very office bound and sort of relationships like like fluoristic quality assessment like that fluoristic integrity curve when i when i started pick, pulling that out of the data when that relationship started to emerge because nothing like that exists i was like this has to be published mm-hmm. we have to this is amazing this can revolutionize the way we see systems because it did in my mind so i started looking for statisticians because i'm not a math guy mm-hmm. um, to like okay how do we how do we statistically get this into something that is usable and i've met with five university statisticians kind of just move it up the ladder into better and better ones um and and they won't touch it because 
because in in the whole in this in the field of statistics curvilinear relationships like that multivariate or not multivariate but but uh the polynomial relationships are statistically untouchable and so the first thing i asked these statisticians was well there's got to be all kinds of phenomena in nature that behave that way mm -hmm. and they say oh yeah there definitely are probably most of nature but we have mm -hmm. no way of doing anything with it scientifically mm -hmm. yeah. and i thought wow we do have a very straight line understanding of science um, because yeah. mathematically we can't have any other um, yeah so until we're willing to to diverge from linear thinking mm -hmm. we're, we're going to be victim of our own linear thought right yeah uh, yeah i mean it, sometimes it does take a little bit of our, us to grow as a, a species and our culture to mm -hmm. expand for our understanding you know to expand it almost like it allows some room for that um, knowledge to grow within yeah and, and it's fun because you see that same relationship in invasive species ecology, you know, with invasive species move in, they tend to go nuts and dominate an area. And then 20, 30, depending on, you know, for annual species, 20, 30 years later, they fade into a naturalized mm. um, entity. <clears throat> There's all kinds of plants um, um, that were... Well, um, in the Midwest, in the 1920s and 30s, botanists were writing about black about black eyed Susan. This, this Western black eyed Susan is taking over the Midwest, and they call it they call it invasive before invasive species was a term. Um, you know, we're talking about the uh, Merritt Lyndon Fernald, Charlie mm -hmm. Deep of Indiana. Um, so there was this there was a, you know in, in uh, Oh, vipers, bug gloss, a lot of weeds that we don't even see anymore. Mm. Um, there's all in the journal, journals in the 30s, 40s, 50s, talk about these things coming and then they, you know, we don't even see them anymore. So there's mm. a wave, there's that wave. I can't help but hope and, and think that humans, that that engagement, you know, you move into a system, you have no relationship with it, but as you engage with it over time, mm -hmm. That is the process of ascesis, that that naturalization. It'll find that equilibrium in the end. Yeah. It's just poor sots like us have to suffer while the rest of the world keeps up. Yeah. <laughs> like, oh great. I go, you know, two hundred years from now, that's not gonna do me any good. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think there's the, you know, the perception just comes from that limited window of time that, you know, we get to yeah. experience things in. And yeah. Um, you know, and, and sometimes, you know, and I guess that's one thing is the more I've looked into like, you know, I kind of went through this geeky phase uh, a couple of years ago and I just really into like, you know, geology and geological record, plant evolution and all that. And I guess the thing that really, you know, that I really took from all that is, you know, I'm thinking, you know, about the six mass extinction and all this. And then I'm thinking, mm -hmm. well, you know, the last one, you know, when the comet or the asteroid hit the earth, that was probably a much faster extinction. Yeah. Yeah. And life rebounded, you know, and humans came and, you know, and, yeah. you know, so that just kind of gives me hope, I guess, to think yeah. that, you know, it's, uh, you know, of course, I believe in conserving, you know, what's currently here, what's currently growing. Right. Um, right. But, you know, who's to say that, you know, that's not part of the story of life on Earth, that, you know, we're not, we, we tend as humans to think of ourselves as the, you know, the, the yeah. central character, right? you know, and I don't necessarily think we are, I think we're just playing a part, a role and maybe our role is to set the stage for that next chapter, you know? Yeah, I'm totally with you. And it's weird. I mean, with these this kind of conversations, it's always kind of like, well, you know, I'm not saying invasive species are good. And right. Yeah. I'm not certainly not taking a cavalier attitude towards uh, right. anything. I certainly believe in tackling <laughs> the issues. It's but fine. to yeah, have that we, larger perspective can give you a little bit of uh, right. peace, internal peace sometimes. It you know? does. But it's, it's <laughs> funny how we we kind of like you know, we're all kind of on pins and needles about where this this heretical line is. Um, right. But I think you're absolutely right. And I think that's that's the healthy. It's probably a healthier way to move forward with mm -hmm. the understanding that that you know the difference you know it's like it's like raising kids you know you don't you don't want them to not do bad things you want them to understand mm -hmm. why they don't sure. do bad things. right yeah <laughs> so it's, it's kind of the lesson maybe <laughs> this is like okay well you know we we ultimately know that we can't behave this way but we but we're not going to do it right until we know mm -hmm. well, we can make we can make laws and regulations that's not going to stop anything until we actually have an understanding of a conscious reason for doing it right 
Yeah, and I guess that's, uh, we got a question here in the chat. Uh, Val asks, is this something to act on or just appreciate? Oh, I think it's what totally think? something. I think it's totally something to act on. And, and, I, and I think one of, the, one of the most amazing things that I've seen that is, make, that is growing and changing communities is this, and it's got an unfortunate name. I think maybe there's a better name for it. Um, but um, nature bathing, like, you know, nature lovers go outside and we, we admire and we look at nature, yada, yada, yada. Mm -hmm. But nature bathing is, is this, this con it's not a new concept, but it, it's, it's going out and just, you know, sort of clearing your mind and engaging with systems, feeling, believe, yeah. mm -hmm. it's, 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 it's tree hugging taken to an extreme. Sure. So, it's experiencing it with all the different senses, Exactly. You know, smelling. Exactly. I like to just, some right. leaves have a great smell. Some yep. have no smell, but yep. I like to experiment. Seek is and sometimes yep. it aids in identification. You know? it, it's, it's getting letting, to know these plants on a more intimate level when we you know, get yep. to know them through all the senses. It's, it's letting your neural network come in direct contact with, yes. with, with these other things. And that's going to change. So, so that's, I mean, that's, that's an actionable thing that people can do. Um, and then it sort of feels like, well, yeah, that's good for a person. But people, when people do that, they start realizing how connected they are and they start acting in their community. They're like, hey, I want to tell, I want to teach kids about this. That's the kind of change yes. that, that happens or, you know, is, is to do something like that and then get somebody else involved with it. And, and that's, that's, that's the kind of change that's ultimately going to, going to make a difference, I think. Yeah, especially, uh, you know, catching people at that, uh, the, the younger generation, you know, uh, I think it's, you know, going to be key. Any part of that yeah. is educating them, you know, some yep. people, you know, that gets get set in our ways, you know, as we get older. And so yeah. you know, the best opportunity to kind of affect change is to, you know, start with the, or at least, you know, focus on the young. Um, yeah, that, and I work part of a multi-pronged approach, of course, but yeah and i i work with the you know, most of the staff i hire are, are younger folks and mm -hmm. done it for 20 years so i kind of see a spectrum of, of people and the younger people are i think a, are a little more open to these sort of things than i mean oh. the, the, this kind of conversation you know the people that i work for growing up doug ladd paul nelson in missouri mm -hmm. and, they they would never have this conversation. Doug Ladd and I are still friends, and, and yeah. I don't know if we could have this conversation because <laughs> it's, it's not a conversation that happens anymore. Yet younger mm -hmm. folks are actually seem to actually be really uh, thirsty for it, and that's and that's encouraging. Yeah, definitely. So, hmm. yeah, I think uh, you know, just thinking about all the different ways that life could express itself, and kind of going back to if we met alien life or extraterrestrial life. Yeah. Would we even know that it was trying to communicate with it? Maybe it talks with, you know, sending out chemicals you're supposed to smell, yeah. you know, yeah. like, like, you know, trees that or plants that release certain chemicals that alert other plants to start building up defenses for its pests, you know? Yeah. Um, you know, just, or maybe things are trying to communicate with us and we just don't even hear it. Well, that, or, that's, yep. And I think that's what, I think that's even what like nature bathing is ultimately about. Mm -hmm. It's like, okay, you know, opening up to that and realizing that's, it's it's the namaste again it's the light in me recognizes the light in you and and if you can if you can recognize the light in a uh, fly or mm -hmm. yeah, sure. or, or a deep ecology you know, yeah, and, yeah and invasive, it has its own value you know? yeah the yep. invasive like invasive species ecology to me is like okay this is a good example of where we need to dial down the the rhetoric dial mm -hmm. down the the hype and actually start engaging with the real issue of mm -hmm. you know this is you know invasive species is about us it's not about mm -hmm. invasive species and yeah and i never really thought of that you know because i've definitely been on the uh you know trying to you know oh invasives are bad trying to get rid of each one of them on on my property you know sure but in a way i'm not really appreciating them for what they are you know and Right. You know, I'm kind of treating this as like, okay, yeah, this is, this is an issue, but like in my limited knowledge of the grand story here, that's really happening. You know, I just yeah. think it's an issue. I just have that perception and that who's to say that, that, you know, yeah, I have a very limited perception. So, yeah. And which, and when we question that, and that's, I don't think anybody would say, well, we don't want to do anything about invasive species because mm -hmm. we do. But when we start asking what that relationship is, we mm -hmm. start finding more, we find good ways to 
to engage with it. Like there was there was an article I read the other day that was uh, people were grafting a larger pear, like fruit pear bearing trees onto Bradford pears. Hmm. So we're not going to get rid of all these Bradford pears in this field by this this in this in this underdeveloped part of town or this this economic mm-hmm. disenfranchised part of town. But you could graft real pears onto it and have a community economy based on based on these pears and i put i put that on a on a native plant society page and it within 10 minutes it was it was it was closed (laughs) we can't even have this conversation i was like well this isn't you know i'm not saying we should do this but i think we i don't know why we can't have this conversation you know yeah that's the thing yeah it's just to be open i mean yeah i think sometimes you know and, you know, I think I'm guilty of it as well. It's just sometimes, you know, getting really stuck on one particular point of view and uh, maybe not reacting or maybe not uh, being as open as I should be to mm-hmm. some other points of view on things, you know, and I think it's part, probably just part of the human condition, but, you know, it's, um, yeah, yeah. Uh, I appreciate this. I mean, yeah, I think you've given a lot of us a lot to kind of think about and consider and, Looks yeah, like you got some great yeah. comments in the chat here. Um, I'll read you off some of them. It looks like uh, Brenda was asking, was that Cherokee Prairie near the Charleston, Arkansas area? Um, yes. Brought up. Okay. Definitely was. Yeah. Well, good. Yeah, uh, Wild F, I'm not sure who that is, but they say thank you for a thought-provoking presentation. Jennifer says thank you. Uh, subscriber iPad, I'm not sure who that is, but they say all I can say is wow and thank you. Mm. Uh, David Darby says he's going to take a little while to try to uh, grok on that. So I think he's going to wrap his mind around it, but it will be the recording will be on YouTube to watch this again later. Uh, if you want to you know, have an opportunity to uh, go back and revisit some of the things that Justin talked about today. And then Curtis uh, Leister uh, also says thank you. So again, you. Um, I also want to extend a thank you to you, Justin. I really appreciate it. Appreciate you spending your time putting this together for us and uh, kind of giving us a very thought-provoking presentation. It's a little bit been a little bit different than what we have normally had. And that's why whenever you propose this, I really oh well, this is great. This is you know, it's not just about you know, it, it, it's a little yeah. bit deeper approach. And so yeah, I, I really appreciate this little change of pace and still being able to tie it into native plants and ecology and all that. So it it, it was just a great program. And um, thank you. Yeah. So well, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Certainly, certainly. And again, everybody out there, uh, thank you for being with with us here today. Uh, The recording will be on our YouTube channel and join us again on Saturday, December 10th at 10 a.m. for the webinar with Karen Willard on the Carrick species of Arkansas. Again, you can uh, find out more about us on our website, ANPS.org, or visit us on Facebook at facebook.com slash Arkansas Native Plant Society. And to find our channel on YouTube, just get on YouTube and type in Arkansas Native Plant Society, and you should find our channel there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dustin. Dustin. (laughs) Thank you.